Amen. Praise God. Well, today, uh, I'd like to just share a really simple message, and it's called Supply for the Unqualified. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about a few different things uh, of what God might have been laying in my heart, and uh, this, is, this is actually one of the things that I've gone through myself in life as well. Uh, how many people have, ha, has ever felt unqualified? I think that's almost all of us, right? And <clears throat> one of the ways in which uh, you can read that word unqualified uh, is also uh, not having the ability to meet the demands that are placed on you. And I think every single one of us, uh, uh, as long as you are living in this world, there are going to be demands that are placed on us. Every single one of us, regardless of what aspect of life uh, you are in, regardless of what age you're in, we all face demands that are placed upon us. And there are times, maybe very often, when we actually see that there is just no ability in and of ourselves to meet that demand. And thus, the label, <laughs> unqualified. <laughs> one of the ways, one of the biggest ways in which uh, I can think of uh, unqualified is uh, like when you're applying for a job, for example. The job might say that you need X number of years of experience, um, or you need such and such a qualification, and then you apply for the job, but you don't get it because you don't meet the qualification or you don't meet the experience. <clears throat> Maybe for others, it may be in the area of family, where you might be a new parent. Or, well, there are lots of, uh, not old, but uh, parents who have had kids that have grown up. And I'm pretty sure that at some stage uh, in the beginning of your parenthood, you might have felt really unqualified in the beginning when you had that little baby with you. And you just, the, yeah, it's true, isn't it? And some women also go into depression, or you might have actually gone into depression before. Uh, because you saw the demands that were placed upon you to be a good parent, to bring the child up, and you just looked at yourself and said, I just have, I'm just not qualified to do this. <clears throat> but um, I'd like to take it a level higher, because I was actually going to share from that perspective of supply versus demand in your day-to-day. -day. But when I was going to use the scripture as, as our key verse to share on this topic, I actually realized that... Um, I guess from the Apostle Paul's perspective when he was writing this, it was actually from an even higher level, which is your calling and your purpose and your destiny in life. So let's just go to that next verse, um, where this is the key verse for today, or, or rather next slide. It says in 1 Corinthians, For observe your calling, brothers, among you not many wise men according to the flesh, not many mighty men, and not many noble men were called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. In other words, God has chosen the, the stupid things of the world to confuse the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confuse the things which are mighty. And God has chosen <clears throat> the base things of the world the things that are despised. Yes, and he chose things which did not exist to bring to nothing things that do. So God, so on one hand, not only does God choose the weak, not only does God choose the stupid, he even chooses things that actually do not even exist. He even chooses things that do not even exist to bring to, to, bring to nothing the things that do exist. Why? so that no flesh should boast in his presence. <clears throat> so, the very beginning of this verse, it actually says, for observe your calling, brothers. Observe your calling. Do you know that the Bible actually tells us that um, God gave you, when God formed you in your mother's womb, he gave you a destiny. Behold, I have plans for you, plans for good and not for evil. How many of us believe that? Yeah. That God has got plans for, for every single one of us, right? Before you were even born, when God had wonderfully formed you and shaped you, he, he had plans for you, plans for your good, not for your evil, plans for prosperity. So God has birthed in every single one of us a, a, a purpose 
and a calling and a destiny. And I think many of us <clears throat> would have known at, at, at some time or rather in, in our life, what is it that we would really like to do? What is it that we would really love to do? Because God put it in us. But then you look at your life. Actually, what time? But then you look at your life and uh, you look at yourself. And then you look at your qualifications, your skills, your ability as a person. You look at your strengths or you look at your circumstances and situations around you. And you think to yourself, hmm, you know, I would really love to do that, but I don't think it's for me. I think it's maybe for someone else. And so what we do is we then end up living our life according to the system of the world, according to the, the way our society works. And we put those dreams behind. I'd just like to ask, how many people here have, ha has ever felt that God has a purpose and meaning in your life, but you have not really actually walked it out because you felt inadequate to do it? I know I have. I know I have. And the truth be told, I think many. I think many people have. And that's why, you know, it says that many are called, but few are chosen. And if you think about why many are called, but few are chosen, if God has called many, how come few are chosen? How come few are chosen? It's because many of us have been hoodwinked by the enemy to look at ourselves and to think that that calling, that destiny, and that purpose that God had placed in our heart will come from our own ability. And therefore, so many of us disqualify ourselves from actually walking out that purpose and meaning in our lives. So I'd just like to share from the, because I, I, I can say this, but it probably won't mean too much. Uh, just sharing from uh, one verse. So let's just pray and uh, we'll end. <laughs> this is joking. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, use a few Bible heroes as examples to show how, they, how this verse actually applied to them. Okay, so we'll go to the next verse, and let's start off with Moses. How many people in this room know Moses? Every single one knows Moses. That is great. Well, with Moses, Moses, how was Moses unqualified? Well, he, wow, you're not going to be able to see that, hey? He had, he had no skill, no ability. Now, we know that Moses was called to do great things, right? So <clears throat> Moses, what, what, what's the story about Moses? Well, Moses was born uh, as, as, a, as an Israeli, but because of a decree to kill all the children of a certain age to try to get rid of the Messiah that was to come, uh, Moses' mother put Moses in a, in a river, and he floated, floated, floated away. And then, lo and behold, Pharaoh's daughter saw this beautiful baby in a basket and looked after Moses and took care of Moses. Now, Moses, when he hit the age of 40, he had a, he had a desire in his heart for his own brothers, his own fellow brothers, the Israelis that were kept as uh, slaves. And he felt in his heart that he wants to do something for them, right? It, it, it's, it's not a bad desire. It, it's a noble one, and it's a good one. And if anything, we know that that desire that Moses had in his heart uh, to liberate uh, his, 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 his Israeli brothers was from God. We know that because we know the story of Moses. In the end, we know that he led them through for the 40 years, right? But that desire started when he was 40 years old, when he had that in his heart. And when Moses was 40 years old, at that time, quite funnily enough, he actually had this, a lot of uh, supply, or he had the skill, he had the ability, he had the supply. The Bible tells us that Moses was schooled in the ways of the, in the wisdom of the Egyptian. And back then, Egypt was like, you know, the main uh, Cambridge or Harvard of that day. The Egyptians, they were the leading, they were the leading nation. It tells us also that Moses was, uh, actually Moses was fair in the sight of God, meaning beautiful. Moses was a very beautiful baby. Uh, and also he was powerful in words and deeds. So in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the supply and the qualification, Moses definitely did have it back then. But interestingly enough, um, 
one would think that, well, now that you've got all these boxes ticked, uh, go ahead and, and, and go do it, right? So Moses did. But <clears throat> unfortunately, when he tried to do it, uh, he ended up killing a man. And instead of thinking that his Israeli brothers would understand that he was there for them and that he was trying to do something good by them, instead they didn't understand. And, 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 and they said, what, who made you ruler and judge over us? You, you're going to judge us as well? And because he had killed someone, he ran away. He left the land. I, I don't really know why Moses left, though, because I thought that as a being high in the palace, he, back in those days, it's, it's a not too hard to uh, execute someone. But anyways, that, that's what happened. So he left. And what we see then is that for the next 40 years, there is silence. <clears throat> there is no uh, record of a God speaking to Moses or anything like that. So, and then Moses ended up living in the wilderness for the next 40 years. And then finally, after 40 years, God met him and spoke to him and then issued the decree to get him to liberate the people. Moses, by now, was 80 years old. How many of us are over 80 years old in this room? One, two, only two. So there is hope. By the way, there is hope because Moses only started walking out his calling when he was 80. So if you ever think that you're sitting down there and my time has passed because I have wasted away my life, I've wasted away my youth, I've got news for you, there is hope. Moses only started when he was 80 years old, okay? Just putting it out there, that's true. So, God meets, uh, God meets Moses when he's 80, <clears throat> and what happened? Then Moses said to the Lord, after the Lord told him that he wants him to liberate the people, he, go, he, he, he says to him, O oh Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before you since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Moses, after 40 years, something happened to him in the wilderness. From being a handsome, wise, and eloquent, right, uh, powerful in words and deeds, Moses ended up becoming slow to speak. Maybe he had a nagging wife, I don't know, but the wilderness <laughs> did something to him. The wilderness made him a person in which you would look at and think, my goodness, now? I mean, from Moses' perspective, maybe he's thinking, Lord, now? Now you ask me to liberate your people? Now? If anything, back then, when he was younger, when he was stronger, when he was more handsome, when he had all the wisdom in there, that would have been the time, right? But now? Whew. I think we're starting to see it. I think we're starting to see it. What happened with Moses? God had to wait till he lost his strength in his own self and in his own ability before he was then able to use him. Could it be that sometimes... The reason why we are not able to walk out heaven's call in our life is because of our own qualifications? Could it be that your disqualifications are your very own qualifications? Because your qualifications say that I have the supply to meet that need. But yet we see in that uh, verse 29 of uh, 1 Corinthians, it says that, God chooses to use all these weak things and base things and despised things so that no flesh may glory in his sight. So when Moses finally did what he did, we see that who gets the glory? God. And today, 2,000, 2,000, 2, 2,000 years later, we look back and when we look at the great exploits that Moses did, who do we praise? We praise God, right? Because we know what had happened to Moses and the state that Moses was in. But we see in Exodus 4 verse 12, after Moses had declared that he was not eloquent, that he was slow of speech, slow tongue, can't speak, God said, go therefore, I will be your mouth and teach you what to say. 
So we saw Moses no longer had the supply. Moses was now unqualified. But when Moses was unqualified, God became his qualification. Amen? And of course, you're going to know that I'm going to say the grace of God is your qualification. It's undeserved. It's unearned. So we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so what can we learn from Moses? Moses was not usable when he was strong in the flesh. After 40 years of solitude in the wilderness, he lost all ability. But when he had no ability, God was able to use him. And you're never too old. Okay, that's Moses. Let's go on to the next one. I've shared on Joseph before. I love the story of Joseph because it's very encouraging. How many people know the story of Joseph? <clears throat> I think almost everyone, yeah? Anyways, some background about Joseph. Joseph, <clears throat> unlike Moses, who, who uh, knew his call from an innate desire and passion to do something, Joseph was a bit different. Joseph was one who actually had a dream. God showed him a dream. And in Joseph's dream, Joseph saw that he would be leader. Basically, the interpretation of the dream that Joseph had was that he would one day be a leader and lead in a very large capacity. Well, background about Joseph. He was his, uh, he was his father's favorite, but his brothers despised him as, as his uh, father's favorite. And because of jealousy, they plotted to, uh, well, kill him. So one day, and mind you, these are real stories, by the way, yeah? Sometimes, you know, when, when I read these things, it's so easy just to go through these uh, stories of these heroes and then tend to not really think that, but, you know, Moses actually really did exist, and there actually really was a man called Joseph that went through this. So as I'm talking about this, just try to bring that, uh, uh, that, what was that? Yeah, that's right, that, 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 that picture that this is actually something real, it's not just a story. <laughs> it's something real. <clears throat> oh, I lost my train of thought. What was I saying? Um, ah, some, something about Joseph, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, right. So the brothers, the brothers despised him. They plotted to kill him. So Joseph, Joseph was then sold, sold into... But Ah, that's right. They plotted to kill him, but then one of the brothers, I guess, conscience pricked his heart and say, you know, what's the point of killing him? He is our brother. If we kill him, there'll be blood on our hands. Instead of killing him, let's just sell him as a slave. So Joseph ended up being sold as a slave, right? Now, from being sold as a slave, as if that wasn't bad enough, um, when he was sold as a slave, we know that God was with Joseph, and Joseph prospered, and Potiphar then, you know, made him in charge of the whole household. And because Joseph was also very handsome, like Moses, the uh, Potiphar's wife strongly desired him. And then Potiphar's wife wanted to sleep with him. But Joseph, being a godly man that he was, he rejected the wife's advances. Now, the wife was very offended by this, and she was very angry. You know, she was inflamed with the fact, how dare this guy reject me? So when Joseph was trying to run away, she grabbed his coat, cut the long story short. When Potiphar came back, she accuses Joseph of rape. Potiphar then throws Joseph into prison. Now Joseph goes from being a slave to a prisoner. That is bad, isn't it? You think about, if you think about Joseph, what, what would he have been thinking do you think that maybe there were times when Joseph thought to himself, this, this dream that I had, maybe it wasn't really from God? Maybe it was just a dream. I'm pretty sure that Moses felt that way as well. When Moses had this desire to liberate the, the, the sons of Israel, he must have thought in his heart at some time when he, as he was so-called in the wilderness for 40 years, so-called wasting away, but that was, that was because was a, his very disqualification was his qualification, but his wasting away years in the desert, he must have thought, maybe that's for someone else, but not for me. 
I guarantee and I believe that Joseph felt the same way. Because if anything, all hope that he would ever be head was now gone. Because it's bad enough that, that he was a slave. Things seem to be going well in charge of Potiphar's house. Maybe, but I'm a slave. Next thing, prison. Just waiting. And back then, you can imagine the system of the prison back then is not like the system of the prison today where, you know, you might be waiting for the next trial date or something. Back then, there's just no law. You're just, you're just there. Who knows what's going to happen, right? So that's what happened to, to Joseph when he was there. But the Bible does tell us that in uh, Genesis 39, verse 23, it says, the, but the keeper of the prison did not concern himself with anything that was under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. Joseph ended up prospering still, despite the circumstances that he was in. Now, cut the long story short, what happened? One day, Pharaoh has a dream, and Joseph helps to interpret Pharaoh's dream. And as a result of interpreting Pharaoh's dream, Pharaoh says that there's no one in all of Egypt as discerning as you. And then he promotes Joseph to be the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. That comes to pass. So we see that in the end, despite everything that Joseph was going through, when all circumstances seemed to be against him, when his, basically his pedigree, his background, didn't qualify for that dream that he had that he would be a leader, it somehow still came to pass. But yet when it came to pass, there was absolutely no way that you'd be able to look at Joseph and say, well, yeah, Joseph was able to, you know, do, do that because of his background. No, this, this was a slave. This was a prisoner. But God was with him. God was with him. And without digging into the story too much, what we see constantly in Joseph's life was that God was with him. God was with him. And because God was with him, he made him to prosper. Where Joseph had no supply, where Joseph was unqualified, the presence of the Lord with him qualified him. You know, even when, when it says, when Pharaoh actually saw him and, and he said, I have a dream and no one's able to interpret it, I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. But you know what Joseph answered to Pharaoh? He didn't say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I have a word of knowledge. Tell me a dream, I can interpret it. He didn't. He said, it's not in me. Pharaoh, a God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. What can we learn from uh, Joseph? When everything was against him, being sold as a slave, falsely accused, the Lord was with Joseph, and he made him a very successful man. Nothing could keep the presence of God in Joseph's life from prospering him. And God is with you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. The very same hope that Joseph yes. had, Amen. we all have. As much as it was God that was with Joseph that caused him to prosper, despite the worst circumstances and situations that a person could be in, the presence of God was able to overcome. I don't know what you might be going through. You might be facing challenges, circumstances, and situations in your finances, in your work, or even in your family. And the, and the solution to that just might seem bleak to you. When it comes to your calling, you might look at your life and think, there is just absolutely no way that I'm going to be able to walk in what God had called me to because of the circumstances and situations that I had. But the presence of God was with Joseph, and where he was unqualified, God qualified him. Amen? Amen. We go on to the next one. We see from the story of, um, who's this? David. David. What's the, what's the background of David, and what do we know about David? Well... We know that David was a king, and they say he was one of Israel's greatest kings that had ever lived. 
right? David. We love David. We read the Psalms of David, and we get so much out of, out of David. Well, where did David come from? <clears throat> did you know that uh, David's background wasn't one where he was the father's favorite, where he was the first choice, where he did the, 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 um, the important task of the house? If anything, it tells us that David was not only rejected by his father, but he was also despised and he was persecuted like crazy. More persecution than I think you or I would ever face in our lives. How was David rejected? Well, when Saul was king, Saul was not going very well as king, and so God wanted to replace Saul as king. So Samuel, the prophet Samuel, was crying over Saul. It's not working out, it's not working out. God says, how long are you going to cry, you know? Go anoint someone new to be king. So being a prophet, God said, okay, go to uh, Jesse's house, and there he's going he's gonna to get you, Samuel, to anoint the new king. So Samuel goes to Jesse's house. I don't know what he says, but maybe something like, I'm going to anoint a king. So Jesse gets his sons. He gets seven sons. He calls his sons, sons, come in. Prophet wants to see you. Prophet's going to anoint one of you a king. First son goes by. Samuel's, prophet Samuel says, no, not this one. Second one goes by. No, not this one. No, actually, the first one that came by, he said, ah, surely it must be this one. Tall man of God. God told him, don't look at the way men see. God looks at the heart, not this one. So second one, no, not that one. Next one comes, no, not that one. Third one, fourth one comes, no, not that one. Okay, surely the fifth one. Fifth one, you, come. No, not that one. Sixth one comes, and I'm not kidding. The sixth one comes, no, not that one. The seventh one comes, not that one. Prophet Samuel says, that's it. No more sons? God has not given me a green light to anoint anyone. Is that it? Jesse says, the, the dad, oh, oh yeah, there, there, there is one more. Uh, he, he's out in the field looking after the sheep. In other words, there is one more, but surely it's not going to be him. Surely it's not going to be David. I mean, I've brought seven. Surely you will find one out of this seven. That one has to look after the sheep. And sheep are dumb. <laughs> it's good to know that sheep are dumb as well because they're not smart in and of themselves, which is actually a picture of us to our shepherd Jesus, that we ought not to be smart in and of ourselves. We follow him. Amen. Jesus, good shepherd. So anyways... <clears throat> Jesse, uh, Prophet Samuel says, well, we're not going to rest until we get this one in. So Jesse calls David in, and we know what happens. Prophet Samuel pours oil over David. David's flooded in oil, and he's anointed as king. Okay? But I want you to get this. The process in which he was anointed as king wasn't that he was the first. He was the runt of the litter. He wasn't even considered Okay? He was rejected by his own father. People rejecting you is one thing. Your own father rejecting you is a whole different thing. And Joseph, uh, sorry, and David in his brother's eyes, he was also despised. Because see, after he was anointed king, there was one day when uh, Goliath was taunting uh, the, the children of Israel, and his father said, go bring some, some food to the battle line for your brothers. And when he went there, as he went there, he heard the man talking about what will be done for the person who kills Goliath. And, you know, what he heard was actually pretty good because the person that's able to kill this, this Philistine will get to marry the king's daughter, who, of course, must be very beautiful, and that the house wouldn't need to pay taxes forever. So David's wondering, he's like, what? Whoa, what did I hear? Really? For real? So he, he asked another man, hey, hey wh wh what's going to be done for the guy that kills this? And his brother... Eliab sees him there, and what does his brother say? His brother says, um, 
When David's oldest brother Eliab heard David talking to the man, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyways? He demanded. What about those few sheep that you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. So in his brother's eyes, David was seen as a good for nothing, but just good for taking care of sheep. You see? His dad rejects him. His brothers despise him. Hmm. David was anointed as king. David was called to be king. And we go to the next one. Next slide. <clears throat> and then after that, when David finally kills Goliath, maybe David thinks, yeah, yeah, I think I can see this uh, prophecy coming to pass. That's about right. I've killed Goliath, basically saving my whole nation. Yeah, I think, I think that's about right. I can see the trajectory of God. That's it. Killed Goliath, killed, killed Goliath, surely king, right? Saul's going to appreciate me. He wants to give me his armor and everything. Surely I'll be king. Instead, no, not quite. Saul got jealous because of what David did when he heard the woman singing that, you know, Saul has slain thousands, but David has slain 10,000s. And the Bible tells us that from that moment when Saul heard that, his heart turned against David in jealousy. And if you read the story of David in 1 Samuel, you see that this was just the beginning of all his nightmares of the persecution and the trouble that David was going to be going through. If anything, he was far from qualified to see that calling of God in his life come into reality. Instead of being ushered into the administration of the kingdom, David now had to actually run away and flee and live in the wilderness. Instead of learning the ways of the kingdom to be the next king, David was now in enemy territory, serving under the actual enemy while in the background helping Israel. But the point is, David was in the wilderness. He was away. In terms of all sense of qualification, there might have been times when David thought to himself, and, and David got so stressed at times, you know. There would have been times when he thought, am I really meant to be king? Saul's trying to kill me. I haven't even, you, you know what the worst thing out of all of this? I haven't even done anything wrong. Like Joseph as well. I haven't even done, I mean, for Moses, he killed a man. But for David, I haven't even done anything. If anything, I've been honoring this man. And he's trying to kill me. But what can we see? What can we see in, uh, in David? Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> as a result of God's grace with him, we see that the Lord gave David favor with his son Jonathan and Micah, who helped him to escape from, from Saul's attempts to kill him. When David was in the wilderness, God increased David's mighty man from 400 to 600. And while David was in exile, the Lord continually gave David victory. Now at the end of it, we see in 2 Samuel that... After Saul was finally killed in battle and, every, and all the dust had settled between the, the conflict between uh, Saul's house and David's house, in the end, 2 Samuel verse 30, no, sorry, second, in 2 Samuel 5 verse 3, we see that they finally anointed David king over Israel. Just wondering where I'm reading from the right. Yeah, that's right. They finally anointed King David king when he was 30 years old over Israel. And for the next 40 years, he reigned till he was 70. Despite 
everything that David went through. We see that in David's life. Now, side point, one thing interesting about this that I was seeing when I was uh, studying between Moses and David, do you notice this? David reigned as king until he was 70 years old. So David lived till 70, right? He reigned as king. Every, everything, all the difficulty that David went through, all the hardships, all the trials, everything, what a full life David lived. Would, that, would, would, would we all agree that David lived a full life? He did, right? He died at 70. Moses started out the fullness of his calling when he was 80, 10 years after David would have died. I don't mean in terms of timeline, but I mean, you know, Moses, David lived at 70, Moses started at 80. Isn't that so interesting? Isn't that so interesting how God can work? That even, even when you've got this Bible hero, King David, did all these things till he was 70. Here's some other character in the Bible who after 70 is still living like a wild man in, in, in the wilderness, plus another 10 more years for God to prepare him before he was ready to use him. I'm just hopping in this point again that it's never too late. You can never put God in a box, right? Oh, you can't put God in a box. You can't put God in a box. I bet Moses, when he sees David <coughs> in heaven, would say, my goodness, all that you that accomplished when you, by the time you were 70, I was still uh, <coughs> walking around for another 10 more years. <laughs> okay. Let's go on to the next slide. I'm almost done. Almost done. Not enough time. Uh, my intention was to drill down into... Uh, a few others as well in the same way, but I know that if I do, everyone's probably gonna fall asleep, and then I'm gonna end up, end up becoming like a news reader. So I'll just skim through the other characters. Then there's also Simon. Simon was born out of wedlock. We know that he was born out of murder and adultery, and yet despite all the other siblings that could have been the rightful heir to the throne, he was chosen to be king. You have Ruth. Ruth ended up marrying the richest man in the field, even though she was a Moabite and she, was, and she came from a despised culture and background. You have Peter. Love Peter. Peter denied Jesus three times when Jesus was being crucified. And then after the crucifixion, when Jesus appeared to Peter again, Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me? That is a deep affection and love. Peter answered him, Lord, I filio you. I love you, which is friendship love, lower level. God commissioned, Jesus commissioned him. Jesus asked him again, Peter, do you agape me? Higher, higher level kind of love. Peter said, Lord, I filio you. I friendship love you. It's a lower level. Jesus commissioned him again. And then the third time, Jesus said, Peter, do you filio me? Peter was grieved in his heart and said, Lord, I filio you. And then he commissioned him to go and be the head of the church. You know, what I see in this is actually something very beautiful because there, 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 there are many different commentaries in terms of why Peter was grieved when he asked him the third time. To me personally, I think, I think the reason why Peter might have been grieved was because he realized that in and of himself, he actually didn't have the ability to love Jesus back like the way Jesus loved him. Because you see, before the cross, Peter boasted of his love for Jesus. But when push came to shove, Peter saw that he failed. And he bitterly cried because he failed. Now Peter has learned. Now Peter has grown. When Jesus asked Peter, do you agape me? Peter said, I feel you. The third time Jesus says, do you feel me? Peter says, I feel you. And I think... Peter might have been grieved because he realized, you know, that I don't have it in and of myself to love this man like the way he's loved me. Truth be said, I know that all of us can relate to this because every single one of us knows what we sometimes ought to do. We know that, you know, I should be believing, be able to be believing God for this breakthrough or this thing, but I just don't have faith. I just don't have it in me. But sometimes we cry when we listen to a message as we hear and learn of God's love for us. And sometimes the reaction that we give back is we cry because we're, we're so touched and moved by the love of God for us, but we know that in and of ourselves, we don't have that love to give it back to Him. But what's interesting about this is that despite that, 
Jesus still commissioned Peter to be head over the church in the midst of his inadequacies. And we all know what Peter ended up doing. Amen. And then lastly, Paul. There's a lot more, but these are just the ones that I know. There's Paul. Paul was chosen to be an apostle to the Gentiles, was given the gospel of grace, the revelation of righteousness by faith, and wrote two-thirds of the, testi- of the New Testament. Yet, what do we know about Paul? This guy was the Pharisee of Pharisees. And when the new baby church was being born in its infancy stage, he was there persecuting the church, putting people to death. One of them we know, Stephen Amada, great man of God. He was the one that gave the green light for Stephen to be, to be stoned. This Paul, if anything, would have been the least qualified. Why didn't God get um, the guy that prayed for Paul's scales to fall off his eyes instead? I think his name was Ananias as well. Why didn't God get him instead? Why didn't get God, uh, 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 God get maybe John? John, the beloved disciple, right? Who, 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 who knows and feeds on the love of Jesus for himself. Why didn't he get John to do that? to do all these things. Why get Paul? Why get the most legalistic one, the most ridiculously legalistic one? So that we, today, can look at what Paul had did and say, truly, this was the work of God. This is the might of God. This is the power of God. Not looking at a person and saying that, you know, it's Paul, surely it's him. But look at the most legalistic person and say, truly, this is the work of God. Only God could have done it. And Jesus gets all the glory. Amen. So we see one thing in common with all these heroes of our faith that we see. They all missed the mark somewhere, and they all failed somewhere. Be it whether it was because of things that were done to them, or because it's because of things that they did, or whether it was because of circumstances and situations they had control over, or whether it was from that background, that pedigree. They all missed the mark somewhere. They all didn't hit it somewhere, but they had something in common. They all had God. They all sought God, and they all had his promises. Let's go to the next slide. Reason why why it's important for us to realize that commonality is because of this. You see, without this one thing in common that they had, God, then they would have just been in the dire circumstances that they were. Moses would have just rotted in the wilderness and died. Joseph would have just rotted in prison and died. David would have just been persecuted by Saul and killed. Solomon would not have been made king because of his pedigree from where he came from. Ruth would not have married Boaz and she would have died and starved with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Paul would have continued being a legalistic Pharisee destroying the church, and not doing anything meaningful in life. But because they had God, because they had Jesus, because they had His grace, because God was with them, what was meant for a life of meaningless, they saw every single one of their destinies, their callings, their meaning and their purpose brought to life. I say the same thing to you here today, to every single one of us, that you might have had something in your heart. Maybe you might have been like Moses, where you know that in your heart, God had placed something in your heart for a purpose to do. But up till now, you might have actually thought, but it's not me because of the world, your world that you look at, you think, it's not me, it's for someone else. Maybe you might have been like a David, where someone had actually given a word of prophecy over you and declared things that God had called you to, and that word resonated in your spirit, and you had an amen. But you look at your life thus far, of how things have panned out thus far, and you think to yourself, Maybe that word was wrong. Or maybe you might be like a Joseph where you had a dream and you saw that God was going to get you to do certain things. But you've seen how life has panned out thus far and thought, maybe not me. But whatever it is, whether it is 
whether God has called you into the ministry or whether God has called you into a certain area of business or maybe God has called you into creative industries, whatever it is that God has called you to. You know, don't, don't, don't only think that when, when we talk about calling, it means ministry, pulpit ministry, all these things. The Bible tells us that, I, I can't remember what's the name of one guy, but uh, God had anointed him in creativity, and he was the one that decorated the, the temple, you know, made the temple very beautiful. So God has different callings in our life. But the point I'm trying to make is I'm not, I'm not just talking about ministry, but what I'm talking about is the calling, the purpose that God had birthed in you, that he had given you. If you ever feel and you look at your world and you think that because of how things have panned out in my life thus far, I don't think that that is for me. I'm trying to tell you, my friends, that your disqualification is the very qualification for God to use you. Because we can learn from all these people in the Bible that they were no different. When I asked you, I said, who knows the story of Moses? Everyone put up their hand. Who knows the story of David? Everyone put up their hand. Who knows the story of Joseph? Everyone put up their hand. But yet so often we forget that these people, as great as they were, were exactly just like us. But God came through. Amen? And so we see, back to the, the, the key verse today, for observe your calling, brothers, among you, not many wise men according to the flesh, not many mighty men, and not many noble were called. Not many wise according to the flesh, their own ability. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confuse the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And God has chosen the base things of the world, and the things that are despised. Yes, he chose those which did not exist to bring to nothing things that do, so that no flesh should boast in his presence. Verse 30, but because of him, but because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, whom God made unto us wisdom. God is your wisdom. You don't need to rely on your own wisdom to bring to pass that calling that God had placed in your life. God made, we have Jesus, whom God made unto us wisdom, righteousness. Righteousness. You are right. You're in right standings to walk out that which God had placed in your life. You don't need to be qualified. You don't need to try to earn favor with God. He has made you righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So much that you can go into in these three things, but as it is written, therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So why are we able to boast in the Lord? It is because of our disqualification. It is because when we end up doing what we do by his grace, by his ability, no flesh has the opportunity to boast before God and say, Lord, the reason why I am so successful in what I do is because I am so good in this. No. It is because you say, the reason why I am so able to do this is because of you, Jesus. It's because of you. Mm-hmm. Romans 8.37, yet amid all these things, what things? What things? The trouble, your world, the disqualification, your lack your lack, the circumstances, the difficulties that you face, yet amid all these things, we are more than conquerors and gain a surpassing victory through him who loved us. For I am persuaded beyond doubt and sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things impending and threatening, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation. Basically what Paul's trying to say, absolutely nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God. Will be able to separate you from that calling, from that purpose, from that destiny that he had birthed in your heart through Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. So today I summarize my, I think that's it. Today I summarize my sharing. 
that all of us, every single one of us, has a life of tremendous excitement. God formed you and He created you with such a purpose and a destiny. It's not a destiny that you chose. You didn't choose this life. Jesus chose us. And when He formed you and when He shaped you, He birthed in you that hope, that destiny. And every single one of us, no matter how old we are, we have the opportunity to start walking that out. The very first step towards that is to realize that in Jesus, we have all supply for our disqualifications. What's the name of? And that's why the title of this message today is Supply for the Unqualified. Amen? Can we all stand? I'd just like to pray for us. If you feel that this has spoken to you and it resonates in your heart, and you feel that, yep, I know that as a little girl, as a little boy, or when I was a young teen, I, 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 I know that God had placed something in my heart, but because of the way things have panned out, now I don't really think that um, maybe that was a word that was for me. I say to you that Jesus knew every single thing that you were going through, he knew every single thing that all these heroes were going through, and he is able to make everything work for good. The Bible tells us that he is able to give us beauty for ashes. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word today. And I just want to pray in the name of Jesus, your grace over every single person. To that purpose and that calling, that you had placed in their heart. Regardless of what that they, every one of us has gone through, I pray that today, Lord Jesus, you open our eyes to see that our very disqualifications are actually our qualifications so that you, Jesus Christ, may be glorified. And I speak life into every single dream that you had placed in the hearts of every single person under the sound of my voice in the name of Jesus. And I declare that as you had formed us, as you had purposed us, as you had created us in our mother's womb in the name of Jesus, I pray that every single person will walk out their days according to the meaning, the purpose, and the calling that you had birthed into their lives in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you fill our lives with excitement. That, and I thank you, Lord, that you have not called us to... To, 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 to mediocrity, but you have called us, Lord, for a life of tremendous passion and joy and excitement. I speak the grace of God over your life. My dear friends, the undeserved, the unearned and undeserved favor of God shine over you in the name of Jesus. And I declare in the name of Jesus, turn every single thing that has been negative into something positive. We receive beauty for ashes in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. That's it. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> Amen.